We're in Joshua chapter 1. Begin reading in verse 1, Joshua chapter 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Amen. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Last week we were encouraged by the promise that God gave to Joshua as he faced the monumental task of leading the nation of Israel to possess that which God had graciously given them. Moses was the servant of the Lord used to lead Israel out of Egypt and then to prepare them in the wandering around in the wilderness. There was preparation going on under Moses' leadership for the possession of the promise of God. God gave them three times. We read that in, that, in those nine verses. God had given them something, but they had to possess it. They had to take it. I want to make a correction here this morning. I was approached after the message last week with a, a, a correction, a, a clarification, and I need to pass it along to you. I had said last week that Moses was kept out of the promised land because of his unbelief, his expression of unbelief, which is true. What wasn't true is I said that Moses struck the rock twice when he was told to strike it once. I don't know if anybody else picked up on that, but somebody did. And what I was doing was confusing things in my mind as I was talking about that from memory. And what actually happened was uh, Moses did strike the rock once. That was early on uh, when they were near Rephidim in Exodus chapter 17 and water came out of the rock. The second time was later on in their journey when they were near Kadesh. And at that time, God didn't say strike the rock. He said speak to the rock. And he struck it twice. Now we could say that that's just a trivia, Bible trivia, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. There's nothing in the Bible that's trivia for one. Uh, so whether we understand it to be trivia or not, it's not. But secondly, there is something being expressed there. 
And this is, this is not the point of the message to try to unlock all that's being said in that uh, illustration of striking the rock. But the rock was, was smitten once. It didn't need to be smitten again. Christ was smitten once. And that's, that rock was already smitten. And they were drinking from that rock, which is Christ, according to 1 Corinthians. And that second time, all that was needed was speaking. We proclaim the Word of God. We don't have a, that's one of the reasons we don't do a mass. We don't do any of that stuff, because the, the rock has already been smitten. And now we're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We speak forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I think at least that much is significant in those two expressions. So just in case someone was twisted up in your mind and say, man, the preacher got that wrong. I did get it wrong. Okay, so I don't want you to get it wrong. That's the correct uh, view of the smiting of the rock. We have... By the way, if you ever hear me say anything wrong, it's okay to come tell me, and I'm, I'm okay to, to deal with it. If it's, if it's wrong, don't carry it around with you and think bad of me. Go ahead and, and get it out. I, I want the truth to go out, and, and it's okay to speak to me about things. We've noted that Joshua is representative of Jesus in the sense that all that is promised to the seed of Abraham is secured by Jehovah's salvation, which is what Jehoshua means. And we saw that two weeks ago as we looked at the introduction to the book of Joshua. We touched upon it last week as well. But as Joshua leads the nation of Israel to possess their possessions, so we today look to and depend upon Jesus Christ to lead us to our inheritance. We have a greater than Joshua. And He is Jesus Christ. And we must look to Him. And we must never take our eyes off of Him. And where Joshua failed, Jesus did not fail. We have a Joshua that is perfect. And you can follow Him completely, implicitly. You can follow Jesus Christ. God promises to Joshua... And what God promises to Joshua in these first nine verses, what He says to him, He says to us who are in Jesus Christ. And last week we focused upon the, the promise that God gave to Joshua and to the nation of Israel that He would be with them. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. I, I love to just repeat those words. I tell you, when I'm feeling like... My energy is zapped and I can't continue doing what God has called me to do. I am reminded, I will not fail thee. I will be with thee. When I get the feeling like, God, you, you promised this and I just don't see it happening. I'm reminded that God said, I will not fail thee. I will be with thee. So if I think I should be receiving something that I have not yet received, I'm either misunderstanding the promise that has been given, or it's coming. Because he said, I will not fail thee. I will be with thee. And then in verse 9, we emphasize that expression, the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Isn't that encouraging? Wherever you go, now, there's a sense in which that's true no matter where you go, even if you go off the path, even if you go where you shouldn't be. We saw that in the first hour. You do not escape the presence of God, but here it is uniquely connected to those who are obeying God, those who are going where He says go, doing what He says do. You don't have to back away. You don't have to feel inhibited. You don't have to fear or be dismayed, as we'll emphasize here in these scriptures, because he says, I will be with you wherever you go. And that's repeated in the New Testament, isn't it? And we'll emphasize that later on in the message. Well, the Lord God not only promises his continual presence, please do not take that lightly. Achieving the success that God has ordained for us will never come in isolation from Him. 
Some people like to skip over that and go to what we're going to be focusing upon this morning and focusing upon the responsibility that we have and they skip over the fact that God must be with us. He must, He must give us success. It's not our doing that gives success. He gives success. But that success comes in the path of obedience. And so the emphasis that God brings to Joshua is his responsibility. And he names specific responsibilities that will result in success. Guaranteed. He says you will be successful. You will prosper. If you respond in obedience to what I say. And so we can say, achieving the success that God has ordained for us will never come apart from fulfilling our God-given responsibilities. Do not disconnect the two. There are those who emphasize so much the sovereignty of God and the, the grace of God apart from the responsibility that that's, they, they live in that realm of God giving them regardless of what they do. That is not the message of Scripture. There is what Paul says twice in the Roman letter, the obedience of faith. In fact, he said, that's what I'm doing as I go around the world, as I'm preaching the gospel of God for the obedience of faith. Romans 1 and Romans 16. They're like bookends to the book of Romans. The obedience of faith is a vital principle in the gospel of God and the gospel of grace. I hope you understand that. God presses us this morning as we are considering these words to Joshua. He presses us. I hope you'll take this personally. If you're a Christian here today, I hope you'll take this personally. If you're not a Christian, you need to cut, get right with God through Jesus Christ. I hope you'll not hear what I say this morning and say, well, i got to ramp up my activities. i got to start doing more. If you're not a Christian, if you're not in Christ, there's a sense in which you can forget about everything you're going to hear from this point, point forward. You need to deal with your own sin before God. You need a sacrifice for your sin. You need a cleansing before the Holy God, and that's found in the blood of Jesus Christ. You do need a Savior. You need a Joshua. You need a Jehoshua. You need Jehovah's Deliverer. And it's not you, and it's not what you do. It's not your performance. It's Jesus Christ alone. There needs to be the shedding of blood. You, you, get, out of, you get out of Egypt by the shedding of blood. Remember that. Blood was shed before they departed Egypt. Okay? And before there can be the possession of promises, blood had to be shed. You need Christ. So I point you to Him. But those of you who are born again of the Spirit of God, and you do know the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility. God has promised He's not going to fail you. He's going to be with you. And it's because of who He is and because of what He has promised that you can then listen to the responsibilities that He places upon you and you can respond. You have the ability to respond. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. And of course, I'm speaking from a New Testament perspective here as I say that. As we read these words in this Old Testament context, but let's look at three of the responsibilities that God specifically gives to Joshua and from Joshua to the people. The first is this. You have a responsibility to maintain a proper attitude. As you engage in possessing all that God has promised, you need to maintain a proper attitude. What is that attitude? He says, be strong and of a good courage. Three times, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9. He says, B, you have a responsibility to be strong and of a good courage. Sh strength and courage, as he sets it forth here, doesn't just happen. You have the responsibility. Be strong. 
and of a good courage. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. And then in verse 9, be strong and of a good courage. It's interesting there in verse 9, he says, have not I commanded thee? And then he says, be strong and of a good courage. You can see the point here. The only way that you can really be strong and of a good courage, the only way that you can really have this stability and this encouragement that you need is the recognition by faith uh, that God has spoken and God has promised. What is, what is it to be strong and of a good courage? It was helpful for me as I thought about this to look at the opposite. And I think the opposite is given in verse 9 where he says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. And then he says, Be not. That's what you're to be. Here's what you're not to be. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. The word dismayed is to be discouraged. To be despondent. Fear and discouragement, those are fleshly, natural responses to overwhelming circumstances of life. All of us deal with it. That's why over and over again in the Scriptures we hear God saying, Fear thou not. Do not fear. It's a predominant command of Scripture. Don't fear. And don't be discouraged. Have not I commanded thee? Strength. Stability and courage results from trust in God. I read this verse in the last hour, Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Yeah. Can you, can you lay hold of that? Fear thou not. Why shouldn't I fear? Look at what's going on. Look at the uncertainty. I know what's across the Jordan River. Why shouldn't I fear? Because Jehovah God who created all things, who is all that He says that He is, is with you. I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't be discouraged. For I am thy God. Does your faith lay hold of that reality? I'm your God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Regardless of what it is you're talking about, the context of your life, especially in the, in the area of, 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 of ministry, of, of doing, walking in obedience, doing what God has called you to do as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as a son or a daughter as a worker, whatever level, doing what God has commanded us to do, preaching. I had this feeling down there this morning like, I, I don't know if I can do this. It's just weird. I know it probably sounds weird to you because I don't stand up here and sound like I feel that way. But that's the way I felt. And I hear God saying, don't fear. Just keep walking. Keep, keep going. Possess it. I've given you a responsibility. I'll be with you. Can, you. can you hear that in your own life? Whatever your sphere of responsibility is, can you hear God saying, I'm with you. Take steps. Go forward. Rise up. Cross that Jordan. Do what I've told you to do. Remember the risen Savior's words to the apostles and to the New Testament church, to us. After he, before He ascended, at some point before He ascended, He said to them, all power is given to Me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore. Therefore, go. Don't go because of you. Don't go because of who you are. Go because all 
power, all authority is given to him. And he says, that's where he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world or this age. He doesn't command in isolation from himself. God never, ever tells us, His people, to do anything in isolation from Him. I'll be with you. We need to maintain that attitude then of strength and courage, of stability and courage. Don't fear. Don't be dismayed. And oh, strength and courage is especially needed for leaders. Before I say any more, I might remind you that most of us are leaders in some sphere in life. You husbands at home, or perhaps it's in the workplace, but you, you wives and mothers over children, there is a place of leadership for you. Be strong and of a good courage. Verse 6, For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land. This was a word to a leader, to Joshua which I swear unto their fathers to give them. I'm going to give it to them, but you're going to lead them. And I apply this to myself as a pastor. And it's not an easy thing to lead people. But leaders set the tone. Husbands, fathers, you set the tone in your homes. Mothers, you set the tone before those children. You set the tone in your workplace if you're a leader there. I have the responsibility... And if you're a leader in this church, you have a responsibility. If you're a teacher in a class, if you're a deacon, if you're an elder, you have a responsibility. Whatever the sphere of authority is, responsibility, you need strength and you need courage. You see, every follower is not going to immediately get in line. I can imagine Joshua had a few thoughts when he hears the command of God to him. He knew what that nation was like. He saw how they dealt with Moses. He needed strength and he needed courage. Every time I stand in this church and say, this is what we ought to do, based upon the Word of God, I don't, I'm not foolish enough to think that everybody's going to click with me. Everybody's going to immediately say, yeah, absolutely, of course. So I, I need strength and I need courage, not because of me, but because of the authority of God's Word. I need that. I need to lead. You have the responsibility of following. Following, by the way, is not easy. You need strength and courage to do that. And you know, God commands that, doesn't He? He commands following those who are placed in positions of leadership. And we sin against Him when we don't. Do I need to repeat that? We sin against God when we do not follow the leaders that He has placed in our lives. If they're leading according to the Word of God. That's important. There will be resistance if you're in a place of leadership. You need strength and courage. If you're in a place of following, you need strength and courage because you're going to find resistance to following the Word of God. And those who are leading you according to the Word of God. What is true for leaders of God's people is equally necessary for all who are His. And so later on, Joshua exhorts the people over in chapter 10 and verse 25. He exhorts them to be strong and courageous. Just like he was told to be strong and courageous. And then all of us, we are to look unto Jesus who is our Joshua, the author and finisher of our faith. Talking about strength and courage. Talking about strong and courageous. There He is. He's the one we look to. The author and finisher of our faith is really saying He's the one who has established the example of faith. You want to know what faith looks like? Look to Jesus. His success gives us reason to be encouraged and to press on in the fight of faith with strength and courage. When God says to Joshua and to us, be strong and courageous, this is not the power of positive thinking this is not ignoring the realities of life, the difficulties of life. It's not looking across Jordan and say, oh, that's a snap, that's nothing. Just mind over matter kind of thing. No, it's the result of faith in the Almighty God. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It's seeing God for who He is. 
Trusting Him for who He is and for what He's promised. And so you have the expressions in the New Testament like this. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Act like men, be strong. You say, that's arrogant. Well, it is arrogant if you're talking about you being strong in yourself. But it's not in you, it's in the Lord. It's because of who He is, because of your trust in Him. And so Ephesians 6 and verse 10, in the context of the battle against all that would keep you from embracing the blessings of God that are in Christ for you, you find these words, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. This is faith. This is maintaining a proper attitude in the battle. Secondly, this is your responsibility. Unswerving obedience. Verse 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Set your compass and move forward on a path of obedience, unswerving obedience. God has spoken. There is one lawgiver. And if I, if I know what God has said, I must pursue that with everything I am and everything I have. Not because of me, but because of Him. And not because I think it makes sense or I see how it's going to work out, but because of who it is who has said it. Lock in with unshakable confidence that His way is right. Why is His way right? You do not have to answer that question. You just have to know what His way is. We're living in a, a culture that will not accept what we proclaim to be right unless we can prove to them that it's going to equal something that they approve. We back up and say, wait a minute. The reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because God said so. Joshua, lock in on this. Christian, Follower of Christ, lock in on this reality in your mind. I must obey. They were going into a, a land that was filled with influences of Canaanites. And they, which represents the world, and you talk about temptations. This is one of the reasons why God said, deal with those nations as harshly as they ultimately were told to deal with them. This is, this is not a light matter. This is nothing to play with. We're talking about God's way here. That's why unswerving obedience is so important. And it's interesting to read verse 7 and see the connection between this strength and courage and this obedience. He says, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Strength and courage is especially needed in a day and age in which culture rejects absolute standard for right and wrong. And aren't we living in that culture? Everything is questioned. Everything is up for grabs. It's, it's amazing to me the things that even myself as a younger person, it, it was clearly right and clearly wrong. Now nothing is clearly right or clearly wrong. And when you say something is clearly right and clearly wrong, you're clearly wrong. And that's the only thing that seems to be wrong, really, is saying something is absolutely right or wrong. This is one of the reasons why we need courage We need strength and courage. Because it can get discouraging living in the day in which we live. But our attitude needs to be, let God be true and every man a liar. If God has said it, it's true. If God has said it, it's true. Therefore, I believe it. And I want to walk in the light of it. 
The strength and courage of faith is manifested in obedience. You say, I believe God. Do you really? How is belief in God manifested? Isn't it in obeying Him? It's so disturbing and so troubling to hear people say, I believe God, and yet they continue to walk in disobedience. That doesn't make sense. I believe God. Therefore, I will obey Him. Even if I... You know, how is this nation going to go into the land of Canaan and fight against the Hittites, fight against the giants who are still in the land? How, how are they going to accomplish victory? How are they going to, It doesn't make sense. Joshua, I, I suggest you park it on the east side. It's safe there. Just find some good ground there. But no, God said cross. God said take the land. I've given it to you. Even though... He might not have understood how it was going to happen. He needed to obey. And he says, turn not to the right hand or to the left. Can you remember that? Can that be a practical thought in your mind as you're living your life? Tomorrow, you're going to be faced with decisions. Today, you're going to be faced with decisions. And you know what God says on something. And if you don't know, you ought to go try to find out what God says on something. And if you see that God says this on a matter... Don't be swayed. There are going to be people who are going to try to sway you one way or the other. Your own thinking is going to try to... You're still in the flesh. And say, not to the right hand, not to the left. I'm going to stay focused on what God has commanded of me. Unswerving obedience. There's stability there. If you have the Spirit of unswerving obedience. There's strength and there's courage there. We need that in the Christian community. I want Community Baptist Church to be a people of strength and courage. People who aren't being shaped and formed by the culture, by society. Well, that's what the world says is okay. and So we just sort of gravitate. Let the world control our, our decision making. No! No! Unswerving obedience. And then the third thing, responsibility that we have. And this is so critical. Sat being saturated with the Word of God. Amen. You see that in verse 8? And really it's back up in verse 7 as well. I mean, you're not going to know the law. You can't observe that which you don't know. But verse 8, he says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. And what exactly is he saying there? I mean, it, commentators try to guess at what's being sa said there, but I just kind of want to take it practically. Don't spit it out. Keep it in you. Chew on it. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. That helps us out. Chew on it. Meditate. Therein day and night. Not just that early morning 10 minute devotion time you have. Or that late night 10 minute devotion time you have. Day and night. And that's not just constantly reading it. Meditating on it. Day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. The book of the law, all that is written, God says to Joshua. And for Joshua and Israel, this at least, at the very least, it was the book of Deuteronomy. Some say that's what specifically is being referenced here. Probably all of the books of Moses, the book of the laws it's called, five books preceded Joshua. For us, it's all of Scripture that's been recorded and preserved, including the... We have the advantage. We have the final testament, the new testament, the final revelation for this age. Jesus has spoken. God hath in those last days spoken to us, spoken by the prophets, in, or in the previous days, spoken by the prophets. In these last days, He has spoken by His Son. We have the final word. Don't let it depart out of your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Constantly reflecting on, seeking to fully understand God, 
seeking to fully understand His way. We spoke on omnipresence in the previous hour. Do you fully grasp omnipresence? I don't. I'm still chewing on it. I'm still meditating. I'm still asking for help. But I want to be affected by the reality of who God is. Do you? I want to be affected by what God says. We're not talking about a, a meditative trance here that seeks to empty the mind and find your true inner self. That spiritual garbage of our day. Or those who seek to find the will of God through some extraordinary feeling or emotional sensation. I just feel like this is what I ought to do. If Joshua were to have crossed the Jordan with that kind of attitude, he would have stopped after Ai's defeat. I'm sure he didn't feel too good after that. And if you're seeking to determine the will of God in your life, and you're determining whether you're going to obey God or not based upon a sensation of feeling, you're not going to go very far. You're not going to be strong and courageous, I'll tell you that. No, we are to process the words of the law. We are to process the Word of God mulling those words over, thinking them through, not just so that we can be more educated, but through all the way through to application in our lives. That word permeating us, saturating us, affecting us. So not just reading, but grasping and implementing the word. Are you doing that? Does that describe you? You guys know, those of you who have had a pastoral visit, you know that's a question that I ask. Are you reading? Are you in the Word regularly? Because you see, if you're not in the Word regularly, the Word is going to be, to the degree that you're in it, it's going to be in you. There's going to be a, there's a correlation there. And clearly, God says, it should be in your mouth. You should meditate there in day and, and night. What Joshua? So Joshua could learn something new? No, not necessarily. The fact of the matter is, you can learn something today, and you can have it down, but if you're not constantly musing and meditating upon that Word, you're, it's going to depart from you. You're going to lose it, and its effect upon you is going to be lost. So, and so we should be daily meditating upon the Word of God. Cause me to hear Thy loving kindness in the morning. Psalm 143.8 When I first read that earlier last week, I read the words. And they were just words. True words. Cause me to hear Thy loving kindness in the morning. Good words. For in Thee do I trust. Cause me to Know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto Thee. A lot of good words there. And if I'd have stopped there, I'd have said, well, I got some good words. But it really didn't impact me till about Thursday. As I continued to muse on the words. And then it hit me. The truth of these words hit me. If I'm, if I'm going to really walk in the sense of His loving kindness to me every morning, He must meet me. He must cause it. He must come to me. He must do something. I'm trusting in you. You give it to me. Now, did I, did I just learn that concept this last week? but it came in a fresh way. And that's the kind of impact the Word of God must have upon us as we're being saturated with it. We're going to fail to achieve the possession of God's promise in Christ if we are not 
knowing and observing the Word of God, unless you think that the words of this text in Joshua apply only to leaders, then you go over to Psalm 1 and you read Psalm 1. It applies to all of us. The same language is found there. In Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, you want to be prosperous? Do you wonder how it is that so-and-so that you've read about or so-and-so that you know has such an incredibly godly Christian life and you look up to them and you say, I wish I could be like them. I tell you, they didn't get that way. First of all, overnight. Second of all, without effort. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. You're going to have to do some separating in your life. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's like honey, sweeter than a honeycomb. It's like fine, better than fine gold. You have to dig for fine gold. You have to dig for the truth of God's word. He shall be like a tree. This is the result. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Daily digestion of the Word of God is essential to prosperity and success in our Christian lives. His Word must be our daily lamp and light. Do you hear the Word of God speaking to you today? Do you hear God saying to you, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Not just for meditation's sake, not just for knowledge's sake, but so that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. What is the result? The promised result is success, prosperity. This is the result of faithful obedience. He says, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 7, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. There are two words, Hebrew words that are used here, that are translated prosper and success. In the King James, there's a bit of, there's a difference in translations, I'll put it that way. In verse 7, he says, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And then in verse 8, when he says, thou shalt have good success, that's the same Hebrew word. In one it's prosper, the other it's success. Same Hebrew word. And then that other word in verse 8, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, that's the word. That's another Hebrew word for prosperity. Interesting. The word that is translated good success in verse 8 and prosper in verse 7 is actually a word that is frequently in the Old Testament translated as wise or wisdom. In fact, in Young's literal translation, if you have access to that, his translation of of Joshua 1, 7 and 8 actually translates that word, thou dost act wisely. And in verse 8, For then thou dost cause thy way to prosper, and then thou dost act wisely. You see what's going on here? Because we're asking the question, what is prosperity? There is the prosperity gospel message going on today, and they'll turn to a passage like this, and they'll say, if you'll do these things, you'll be prosperous and you'll have success, and they attach their definitions to what prosperity and success is. What is God saying to Joshua? In a nutshell, He is saying, you'll have God-ordained prosperity. Whatever God has ordained, that's what you are going to. To have. He doesn't mean financial prosperity. He doesn't mean business success, though that may result. That is not what he means. 
It means that you, you will live according, not according to the wisdom of this world, but according to the wisdom of God, a wisdom that this world does not have. So when he says in verse 7, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest, he's saying that you might be wise, that you might have wisdom, a wisdom that only comes from God's Word. A wisdom that only comes from observing what God says. And so in verse 8, when he says, Thou shalt have good success, he's saying the same thing. That you will have wisdom. Let me show this to you in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 97. I think this is helpful. Psalm 119 and verse 97 through verse 104. Oh, how love I, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Does this sound like Joshua? Though thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding. That's the word that's translated success and prosper in Joshua 1, 7 and 8. I have more understanding. I have success. I have prosperity. More than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. There's prosperity right there. There's success. Hating every false way. Loving the ways of God. Does that describe your life? You say, well, preacher, that's not the kind of prosperity I'm looking for. Then you're not a follower of God. If you're looking for perishable things, if that's what's driving you, that's what's motivating you, perishable things, things that will be burned up in the end, if that's the kind of prosperity and success that you're aiming for, you've got the wrong target. And you may get that. But you will not have the prosperity and the success that God promises to Joshua and to his people. God's way is the way of prosperity and success, regardless of outward circumstances. If you're not living in obedience to God's word, I don't care how successful you are from a worldly point of view. That is not the barometer of true prosperity. I hear people, and it's really kind of sickening, even in the Christian community, they think when they talk about how prosperous materially they are, they say, I'm in the way of God. Look at what I have. That does not determine that you are in the way of God. That may very be a noose around your neck that's taking you to hell. Material prosperity. Do not evaluate that as prosperity and success. It's the way of God that's the way of prosperity and success. Talk to Abraham. You can read about it in, in, in Gen or Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 13. Abraham received a promise from God and he obeyed God, not, not having received what was promised, but he obeyed God. Looking, he looked for a city. He looked for a promise. Faith led him to, to be obedient, to do the things that he did. And he was prosperous and he had good success. What about Joseph? Did Joseph experience success? Did Joseph experience prosperity? He was in prison for 13 years. But he was obedient. He knew what God said. And he was fixated on what God said. He observed to do what God said. He did not follow the lusts of his flesh. And it says, 
in Genesis chapter 39, verses 21 through 23, and you can read the whole account of Joseph, it says that God prospered him. The very word prosper is used. Prospered him while he was still in prison. Of course, you know the rest of the story with Joseph. As you fast forward to the New Testament, now what are the words of Jesus? He says, Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. All of those things that the Gentiles are seeking after. By the way, the things the Gentiles are seeking after in that context are not bad things. Clothing, food, those are just necessities of life. Not extravagant stuff, just I got to live kind of stuff. Jesus says, don't seek those things. You seek first my kingdom, my righteousness. And I'll prosper you. And you'll succeed. Every need will be met as you follow and observe all that I've said. Jesus said to His disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's where our focus needs to be. And you know, all of the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus, aren't they? And so we follow Him. And we follow Him with the expectation of receiving all that is ours as heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This became very personal to me as I meditated upon it. And I'll not go into the personal application, but I'll tell you this, when life gets low, sometimes you want to get off the path of obedience. Sometimes you ask the question, is this what? Is this the reward I get? For following Christ? This is, this is what I get? And there's the temptation to change course, change the path, to jump tracks to something that seems to provide something better. The God in His mercy, the Holy Spirit within us continues to press us. No. Keep believing. Keep doing what I say. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left. Stay on course. Stay in the path. Keep your eyes on Christ. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going, and it's amazing how God can turn circumstances and actually bring to you blessings that you would have never known had you not stayed on that difficult path. Brings victory, brings blessings into your life. Some of you have experienced this. Christian, I say to you today, we have every reason in Jesus Christ to be strong and very courageous. We really do. Believe His promise. Believe His promise that He's, He's always going to be with you. That's what He said. I've asked the question in my lifetime, where are you, God? Just like the psalmist. I've asked that question. I felt like He was nowhere near. But He promised, didn't He? He promised. And faith, that's what faith is about. Faith isn't seeing and believing. Faith is believing and then seeing. So believe God. And then saturate your believing heart with His Word. Did you, did, you, did you hear that? I said, saturate your believing heart. Don't just read this as a book of words. Believe it. Saturate your heart. Your believing heart. They did not, the old, old Israel did not receive the promises because of unbelief. Because Faith was not mixed with the Word that was given to them. God has commanded. He says, I have not I commanded you. Take Him at His Word. Follow Him. Believe His promises. You will then possess in this life and that which is to come. Did you hear that? 
in this life and that which is to come, you will possess all that God promises in His Son. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, he was, go, Philippians chapter 3 said, I hadn't yet obtained everything that, is, you know, I've been apprehended, but I haven't yet got it all. And so he's pressing on to apprehend that for which he was apprehended. That's the life of the Christian. Possessing all that has been promised us in Christ Jesus. You close with this same verse I read last week. Psalm 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. That kind of hit me afresh as I thought about the omnipresence of God. He's a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. So I'm not going to get my eye on the success and the prosperity, especially as it's, as it's explained in our day and age. I'm going to keep my mind and heart fixed upon the Lord who promised to be with me on all that He has commanded. And then, I know He will not withhold any good thing from me. How do I know that? Yeah. The only way that I know that is not because everything I've ever experienced is good by my standard of good, by my idea of good. It's, it's, kind, of like, it's kind of like those, that we run into it all the time, Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, I, I, it's this idea of I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And we come away from that with our own idea of what that means, which is my expectations. And I expect God to give me what I expect. Rather than claiming the promise of God that He, no good thing will He withhold from me. And so I can trust Him. I can obey Him implicitly. And He is going, even if it looks bad to me, I can say, it was good that I was afflicted. I can, you know, everything turns back to Him and what He has determined is, is best for me. And I know that in the end, it's going to be prosperity and success. It's what He has determined for me. I hope that encourages you and helps you. Draw near to God in faith and confidence. Father, I pray that you would bless the words that have been spoken today to help each of us.